Hi, my name is Evelyn Garcia, and my presentation is an assessment of HIV in South Africa. I will be covering a background of South Africa, trends, methods of surveillance, epidemiology of HIV, implemented preventive measures, barriers, assessment of effectiveness, and possible inter uh, prevention or control strategies. So to give you an idea on the background, South Africa is a developing country with a geographic size of 407,900 miles squared, a population of 57.78 million individuals. Uh, this is based on the 2019 mid-year estimates. Of this number, about 30 million, which is 51.2%, are females. Discrepancies regarding access to healthcare are prevalent in South Africa due to barriers associated with the cost of travel, cost of medical attention, and low provider-to-patient ratios. Uh, the legacy of the apartheid period in South Africa still prevails, causing significant inequalities in the edu education, education system, political decision making, and access to healthcare. All these factors working in unison have exacerbated the current HIV situation. Um, overall, given the developing economy of the country, a large group of individuals belong to the lower end of the socioeconomic status spectrum. And this is uh, concerning given evidence of high socioeconomic status association to decrease risk of HIV. Given the previously mentioned deficiencies in infrastructure, South Africa suffers from a high incidence and prevalence of HIV. Neighboring countries to Africa, such as Swaziland, Lesotho, and Botswana, have shown significantly high prevalence of HIV as well in the recent years, uh, fluctuating in the high 20% uh, range. The first case of HIV was uh, recognized and reported in South Africa in 1982, and was this case was travel associated. Um, the South African man found to have the virus had previously traveled to California, and although at first it was thought that the infectious agent was limited only to gay men and promotions for safe, safe sex were targeted only uh, to this population group, it was soon discovered that women and children were also susceptible. Trends in HIV prevalence in the South African uh, region showed an overall increase between 1990 to 2002, as it is shown here in figure one. And these trends seem to mimic, based on this figure, the overall increase in prevalence for, um, for other South Southern African countries. However, they differ from Western Africa trends, as we can see uh, based on the, on the trends in the lines here. Um, these trends also show that South Africa prevalence had a quick increase until matching the prevalence of its neighboring regions, as we see by the gaps in the middle and then convergence towards the end in 2002. So trends in HIV have also been documented in teenagers and women. In a study performed by Ayesha et al. and other uh, authors, a survey was conducted between 2001 to 2013 to estimate prevalence of HIV in pregnant women. And this study showed that overall HIV prevalence increased from 35.3% to 39% in a span of about four years. An interesting observation um, from, from this study is that HIV prevalence in teenage women declined from 22.5% to 17.2%. Um, also in the 2018 antenatal survey, uh, the report showed that HIV incidence uh, of 29.3% occurred in women between 15 to 49 uh, years of age, which agrees with the range reported in the previous uh, two years, in 2017 and 2006. So only figure two here, uh, trends in antenatal HIV seroprevalence had followed a steady increase from 1990 to 2005, reaching a plateau between 2006 and um, to 2006 to 2007. Further considerations in exploring these trends are variations in the different provinces given that these could be pronounced. Um, in 2008, prevalence of HIV antenatal women aged 15 to 49 in the Western Cape was estimated to be 16.1%, while KwaZulu-Natal prevalence was 38.7%. Here we can see the trend of the prevalence of HIV in antenatal women that I was previously referring to. This is figure two. Um, and we can see an increasing trend in prevalence from 1990. And we see a plateau here between 2006 um, to 2008. 
Let's go here. So um, when exploring trends of HIV prevalence and mortality, an important historic event to keep in mind is the emergency emergence of antiretroviral therapy. In South Africa, widespread art use uh, in the public sector began in 2004. And in a study conducted by uh, Berger and other authors with the purpose of assessing the impact of uh, antiretroviral therapy use, a longitudinal household survey was conducted to obtain the data and the results show that <clears throat> since art use began, national annual mortality levels had dropped 30.7% in the black African male population and there was a drastic reduction of 46.6% in the rate of poor health reporting in this same black African male population. So a method of surveillance of HIV in all nine provinces in South Africa is the antenatal HIV seroprevalence survey, which estimates the prevalence of HIV in the pregnant women population aged 15 to 49. Uh, this survey is conducted annually However, it is limited to the aforementioned subjects who visit public clinics in the healthcare sector, which could potentially uh, induce bias. So this survey could be helpful in assessing HIV prevalence in pregnant women and could allow public health officials to develop uh, their programs to address the HIV burden. However, it does have significant limitations given that it's only surveying individuals uh, that use public health sector and it is only for pregnant women. Therefore, um, it could be biased to a better uh, assessment of HIV measures in members of the rural community. Uh, another survey method that is used for HIV surveillance is a household-based survey conducted uh, every three years. And um, this one is also used as a method of estimation for HIV prevalence and incidence. This survey is broad and open to all age groups. However, data from individuals with specific living arrangements is uh, sometimes limited or it could even be excluded. Um, this particular survey uses blood samples to conduct antibody testing for HIV. Well, compared to the antenatal survey, this method is much more appropriate um, in the sense that it obtains a much bigger sample of the population, a more representative uh, one, given that it is uh, significantly more exclusive. Uh, given the nature of the HIV propagated outbreak, this method would be a lot more effective in monitoring HIV prevalence and developing epidemiology-based programs for the treatment or prevention of HIV. According to the mid-year population estimates in 2018 um, were found to be 13.1% uh, for HIV prevalence in the South African population with a total estimated 7.52 million positive cases. HIV cases in the 15 to 49 age group accounted for approximately 19% of the entire South African population for that same year, uh, 2018. Uh, however, this rate doesn't take into consideration any age group outside of the aforementioned range. So in contrast, in contrast to South Africa, Mozambique had a much lower prevalence of 12.6%, uh, for the same year in adults 15 to 49, same age group. Um, based on previous statistical information and given the decreased accessibility to healthcare in rural communities, decreased knowledge regarding preventive mechanisms and lack of transportation um, can, be, can be the reason why citizens in rural communities of South Africa are at a much greater risk of HIV transmission. Um, so further beliefs and stigma regarding HIV testing and care exist in South Africa, which leads to HIV becoming a greater health issue due to internal struggles regarding this culture, testing, or even receiving treatment. Um, according to the 2012 HIV Prevalence Incidents and Behavior Survey taking place in South Africa, HIV prevalence among the participa participating population was found to be 12.2%. Um, it is important to note that this survey until the willingness of the participants to provide blood samples for testing. A prevalence of 12.2 percent, um, although it is, well, it is, I'm sorry, prevalence of 12.2 percent is an alarming rate, um, which when you consider the number of participants in the study that refuse testing and considering possible effects of stigmatization could have on the willingness of these participants to engage in the study, puts into perspective that prevalence rates could have been, could have been much, much higher 
than the 12.2% that was reported based on that work. Um, so to establish a frame of reference here, HIV prevalence in 2012 in the United States ranged from 110 per 100,000 persons in the state of Iowa to 3,936 uh, per 100,000 population in the District of Columbia. So this is roughly about 0.11 to 3.9% prevalence, bottom line. And that number has been compared to the 12.2%. So disparities in HIV mortality and prevalence exist based on racial differences. Uh, to shed light into this matter, the 2012 population-based household sample in South Africa showed that uh, Black African males and females had a significantly higher HIV prevalence compared to other race groups. Uh, further, there were drastic difference between, differences between um, sex. So Black African males had a prevalence of 16.6%, while the women had a much higher prevalence in the 24.1% range. Uh, these disparities bring into question the role of women in the South African uh, community and whether it is a matter of gender roles or there's other factors such as socioeconomic factors that could lead to these higher rates in their population. Um, another finding of the study was that the lower HIV prevalence was correlated with factors such as uh, perceived risk of having HIV, high socioeconomic status, and also being married. So other disparities in HIV prevalence also exist depending on uh, urban or rural locations. In a study conducted by Gibbs and other authors using household survey data for various years, the years were 2002, 2005, 2008, and 2012, locations were categorized into a one of four <coughs> categories, urban formal, urban informal, rural formal, or rural informal. And the results of the study show that HIV prevalence was higher in the urban, urban informal locations with a significantly increasing trend in no HIV prevalence in the rural informal location. So studies have shown that risk factors associated with HIV in the male South African population are fewer years of education or lower level of education, amount of knowledge regarding HIV and uh, AIDS, and attitudes regarding condom use. HIV risk factors associated to women are also uh, attitudes regarding condom use and uh, sex experience. So predominant modes of transmission of HIV are sexually and through syringe. And in the sexual experience, body fluids uh, such as semen, blood, rectal fluids, and vaginal fluids carry the infectious particles and transmit them uh, from one person to another. It has also been found that transmission can occur during breastfeeding. Uh, behaviors that increase HIV risk are anal or vaginal intercourse without condom use. So for implemented uh, preventive measures, the prevalence of HIV in the 15 to 24 population of South Africa ranks um, as one of the highest in the entire world. So HIV prevention in South Africa population have a high aim at this specific age group. And um, this, this group is a public health priority. Um, in a study conducted by Harrison and other uh, authors, eight HIV pr uh, intervention studies were analyzed for structure and outcomes. And they show that most youth-focused interventions aim at reducing substance use or abuse, target economic determinant, determinants, and gender roles uh, or coercion. A plausible implemented preventive strategy to reduce incidence of HIV is also male circumcision. Um, in fact, in a research study conducted in 2012, it was found that 35% of adults in the South Africa community had successfully circumcised at an average age of uh, 15. And other community programs for HIV intervention in the South Africa community are the Love Life Youth Center and Love Life National Adolescent, Adolescent Friendly Clinic Initiative. Both of these programs focus on uh, public health sector clinics to provide educational material and services in reproductive health for the young population. Um, another previously implemented preventive measure was the Summertown Project, which consisted of educational material and distribution of condoms in a gold mining town in South Africa. Barriers. So, um, in a study conducted by Travis Kagan in rural uh, communities of South Africa uh, with, that had high HIV prevalence, uh, situational analysis, qualitative assessment revealed that stigma is a barrier 
to care given the prejudice toward HIV positive individuals exist and many make the association that HIV is synonymous to promiscuity and infidelity. Uh, facilitating access to antiretroviral therapy treatment to the rural populations under study didn't serve as an umbrella approach given that due to these stigmatizations, individuals were still ambivalent regarding seeking uh, treatment. Effic efficacy issues regarding the role of traditional medicine and the medical provider's effective explanation of the importance of medical adherence point at the need of widespread education programs in rural South Africa communities regarding HIV transmission, treatment, and, and also importance of medical compliance. Um, indirectly, these educational programs could serve the purpose of reducing stigmatization of the disease and the individual. The built environment of these rural communities also serve an issue in addressing the condition, given that inadequate transport and inability to afford travel methods to reach a healthcare provider are existing barriers in rural South African communities. So to assess effectiveness, uh, the Summertown project, although promising, was ineffective in achieving its intended results. Um, even though professional help was recruited for the implementation of the program, assessments showed that it made no difference in condom use in individuals participating in the program. Other programs, such as Love Life, uh, uses social networks to provide personalized education and change attitudes regarding risky behaviors in the transmission of HIV. In an assessment of this program, um, using the 2003 2003 National Survey, it was evaluated that both male and female participants of the Love Life program had lower probabilities of HIV transmission than non participants. This evaluation controlled for possible confounding induced by socioeconomic status, education, age, and also marriage. So, comparing the structure of both programs, it can be argued that the effectiveness of the Love Life program compared to the Summertown project relies in the quality of the education provided, given that the Summertown project was a broad and generic approach uh, at educating the community compared to the subjective nature uh, and aim at changing attitudes that the Love Life program uh, has. So here in figure three, uh, it provides insight into a factor in the effectiveness of the Love Life program too. Uh, it can be observed that this program has the the most media exposure in the 15 to 49 age group. And it is closely followed by Soul City, which leads in the 50 or more age group category. So as it relates to addressing the selected uh, condition slash problem, uh, needs of the community are access to healthcare, willingness to receive uh, medical attention and remaining compliant with treatment or testing. Uh, in a study conducted by Lowliger and other researchers in the rural KwaZulu-Natal province of South Africa um, to explore qualitative influences of art adherence and initiation of the and initiation in the HIV positive population, uh, they found that socioeconomic factors had a significant correlation to lack of medical treatment compliance. Uh, so head of households were subject to cognitive dissonance due to having to choose between taking care of their personal health or providing for their families. Uh, food insecurity, insecurity was also correlated with non-compliance given that patients that did not have substantial access to food would experience exacerbated side effects to art on an empty stomach. Um, based on the information provided by the study, access to food sources is the need of the community in order to shift attention from securing the everyday meals to taking care of personal health. Developing a program to allocate food sources and use funding to be able to provide the communities with low cost food sources and through the same method of offer STD testing um, and no cost for these individuals might increase testing given the number of individuals that uh, could be interested in obtaining portions of these meals. This would serve as a two-way approach to offer the food they require, um, well, to offer, to obtain the food, um, they, they could be required to, to undergo an educational class, and this way they can shift um, their attention uh, for providing for their families with the basic necessities um, into their own personal health. And also we increase uh, access to testing, awareness to testing, and we provide the community with this educational material. So 
um, the program could be implemented for families that show food insecurity through a selection criteria. And it would also be helpful if it was aimed at um, a high-risk population. And these are my references. <laughs>